Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for today's community conversation with Sierra Club Maine and our special guest speaker, Aislinn Sarnacki. My name is Marina Bach. I'm the communications and outreach manager here at Sierra Club Maine. And I thank all of you for joining us today. I know it's a beautiful day outside. So thanks for taking the time to be here. Uh, before we be begin, I'll just go over a couple of Zoom logistics. I'm sure you're all pros now, but um, we do ask that you keep your microphone on mute just to help with background noise. And you can feel free to turn on or off your video um, at your choosing throughout the presentation. It is being recorded, so if you don't want to be seen, you can go ahead and turn that off. And then lastly, we ask that you put any questions in the chat. And we'll be going through and monitoring the chat and we'll have some time at the end for some Q&A. And I'd like to just take a minute to uh, acknowledge the land that we live on here in Maine. So Sierra Club acknowledges indigenous land and sovereignty. We are in the homeland of the Wabanaki, the people of the Dawn. We extend our respect and gratitude to the many indigenous people and their ancestors whose rich histories and vibrant communities include the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations, and all of the native communities who have lived here for thousands of generations in what is now known today as Maine, New England, and the Canadian Maritimes. So this acknowledgement does not rectify the ongoing violence of settler colonialism, but is rather meant to cultivate an unsettling awareness of its persistence towards building reconciliation. And um, we are very honored to collaborate with the Wabanaki as they share their stories. And we thank the Abbey Museum for their leadership in decolonization efforts here in Maine and their work to create effective land acknowledgements. And with that, I would like to introduce you all to Beverly Roxby, who will be helping to facilitate today's webinar. Bev has been on Sierra Club Maine's executive committee for the past four years. She lives in Belfast and is a member of the city's climate crisis committee. Bev has been in charge of organizing the chapter's involvement in the Common Ground Fair for the past four years. And we will actually be at the fair this September in the Environmental Concerns Tent, and we invite all of you to come see us. So with that, Bev, I will pass it on to you. Thanks, Marina. Um, I have just a little bit of background on our history here, but I'll be brief because there's a lot that we have to hear from Aislinn. So um, when John Muir was in his 40s, he summited Mount Rainier wearing street shoes. He crawled along crevasses with no ropes. They didn't bring any ropes. And he pounded handmade sharp metal spikes onto his shoes only at the last minute. But afterwards, he had this to say about his experience. Doubly happy is the man to whom lofty mountaintops are within reach, for the lights that shine there illumine all that lies below. Continuing our tradition of getting outdoors, the Sierra Club Maine is offering its first outing since COVID began. Um, it'll be on Memorial Day at the Brazumscot River Preserve in Portland. And you can go to our website for more on this and other upcoming events, outings and general information, what we're involved with um, all over the place, our various teams that are working on things including the community conversations that we've archived on this site. And this one will be archived as well to share with your friends if they couldn't make it today. Our speaker is Aislinn Sarnacki. She will share with us her vast adventures in our state about places that we may never heard of, but are close by and how to hike safely, not like John Muir and be prepared with the proper equipment. She's been a reporter in the outdoor section of the Bangor Daily News for six years, sharing her one minute hikes as a web link on the BDN online, often accompanied by her husband and by her beloved dog, Oreo. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot about Oreo and happily, I guess Aislinn has a new dog, which is great. Aislinn was born in Winterport. She graduated from UMaine where her thesis was on the health benefits of hiking, something I'm sure we could all agree with. She's received several awards, including the Maine Press Association and the 
the Bob Drake Young Writers Award. She has written three books on hiking. She's written Family Friendly Hikes in Maine. She's written Maine Hikes Off the Beaten Path and my personal favorite, Dog Friendly Hikes in Maine. Here to tell you more about hikes and walks available to all of us is Aislinn Sarnacki. Thank you so much. I uh, decided I was outside. I decided I would move inside <laughs> because it was getting windier and windier and uh, hopefully my uh, connection is better in here as well. But if you ever can't hear me or anything, let me know. Um, I'm so pleased to be joining you guys today and I'm excited to talk about hiking. It's been a little while and yeah, first I guess I'll just explain what it is that I do. Um, so for the past 11 years, I've written at the Bangor Daily News full time. And um, for most of that time, I've had a hiking column and that hiking column um, brought me to new places every single week. I tried to do a different trail in Maine. So I've gotten out quite a bit, but the crazy thing is people always asked if I was gonna run out of places to hike eventually. And the answer is no, I didn't get to even close um, to running out really. Um, I kind of saturated my area. I'm from the Bangor area, but a little bit outside of it in Dedham, which is on the way to Ellsworth. And so I've certainly hiked every trail in my within like an hour of myself, um, but I've tried to really get out in the state and um, writing the books for Down East Books, the three books that I wrote, they wanted me to cover the entire state. So I made special trips up north and to the west and east and south, um, really trying to cover as much of the state as possible for those books. So that was good too. Um, and recently, um, kind of new news is um, I stopped working full time at the Bangor Daily News. I am still a weekly columnist for them, which is great. Um, so I'll get to continue to write about my adventures, but I am currently working on becoming a registered Maine guide. So I can bring people out physically. Um, I've been doing it for years via video and photos and writing. Um, and I plan to continue doing that, but I'm really excited to bring people out physically and see their reaction to these beautiful places and be with them. And my goal is to be an interpretive guide um, and really focus on the nature aspect of hiking and talk about the ecosystems along the way and slow down and appreciate trails, whether they're really easy or Katahdin, something like that. Um, yeah, so I have a little slideshow um, prepared and I wanna leave plenty of time for questions, um, but I thought that I would um, do a slideshow to, so that you guys can write down some things that you're interested in from the slideshow and then also share some photos. So I will start sharing my screen now. Let's see, let me practice this, so. All right, can you guys see my screen? Give me a thumbs up. <laughs> cool, all right. So I wanted to focus this talk on hidden hiking gems in Maine, um, which really is whatever I think it is. Um, but uh, hopefully some lesser known trails, some that maybe you haven't heard of um, and driven right past that I've really enjoyed. Um, and a lot of these trails come from the book, Maine Hikes Off the Beaten Path. Um, however, if you have that book, no fear, I will talk about other trails and you'll get something else out of this talk. Um, and these are just my book covers here. They came out one year after another, boom, boom, boom. Um, and each of them have 35 hikes in them that are different um, than the other ones. And the dog friendly one, um, one thing that I added to that particular book is I include like um, places you can eat with your dog outdoors always, I guess, um, is the rule, but where you can eat outdoors with your dog and then lodging options as well, which that was that was an interesting um uh, thing to add into the book because I was doing I was writing the book in the winter time and uh, I kept calling up restaurants asking if I could eat outside with my dog and they were very confused um, but um, all right so I'll get jump right into it um, 
the first trail on my list that I wanted to share because I have such fond memories of it in the springtime, and this is the time to go to this trail if, if you want to, um, is the Annie Sturgis Sanctuary in Vassalboro. It's, um, it's a great place to look for wildflowers. When I was there, I photographed so many different types of wildflowers. Um, no one else was there. And it's kind of this obscure property because it's owned by the New England Wildflower Society. And it, that's one of the cool things in Maine. Um, and one of the reasons I could, my job, I think, and what I was doing became popular is because sometimes it's hard to find trails like this because there are so many different types of landowners in Maine that are generous and offer trails to the public. And so to find these trails, you have to go to all these different websites and all these different books and it takes some legwork. And so this particular trail, I was actually um, in the area because my husband's from that area and I drove by the sign and that's how I even came across it. So, um, so no one else was there. Um, and the, the trail network is actually really well maintained and um, leads to some pretty neat stuff. Dogs aren't permitted on this one though. So this is like one of those places where you can just kind of relax and enjoy wildlife without your dog, which I love my dog, but sometimes I like these places. And here's are just some of the photos that I took there. Um, I wasn't, one of the things that I like to do, um, and I think sometimes people can get a little bit intimidated by being a naturalist or getting into identifying things, but I really have fun with it because um, I just take photos and then come back to my house and try to figure it out. Um, so I learned that like the upper left hand, that's blood root. And then you get to learn all these really cool things about blood root and what it's used for. Um, there's also a really neat stone fireplace on the property. Some neat historical things. The other one that I really enjoy is a canal path in Searsmont. And um, this is a part, I, I kind of chose this to represent a much longer trail, which is called the Georges River Highland Path. And it's a growing network. It used to be 40 miles now. It, and I think at the time that I did the canal path, it was 50 miles and now it's 60 plus miles in the mid coast region. Um, and it is maintained by the George River Land Trust and it crosses all sorts of property owned by different landowners. And this particular path crosses through um, property owned by Robbins Lumber Company. And it visits this old historic canal from the late 1700s. Um, and not only that, like you have a self-guided tour brochure that you can take with you and learn about sustainable forestry practices. And there are some interpretive signs along the way so you know what you're looking at because sometimes it's very easy to walk by the, the remnants of these old things. Um, and this trail, the reason I like it so much, in addition to it just, it being neat that the lumber company would allow you to explore their property, um, is that it travels by the beautiful Georges River, which is lovely year round. I've done this in the winter and in the summertime. And the, the actual forest itself is just really beautiful. I think because it is managed, there's a lot more room for understory plants. And so there's a ton of bunchberry and really cool things like that. Um, so it's just a really pretty, pretty place to walk. And again, it's super quiet. Like I, I haven't, the two times that I went there, no one else was there. Um, and those things change over time as word gets out, but um, yeah, I just remember it being very peaceful and dogs are permitted on leash. I always try to include that now. In the beginning of my um, <laughs> hiking, um, column. I didn't have a dog. And so I would never mention whether or not they were permitted because I didn't even think of it. But then I got my dog Oreo pretty early on in the column. And uh, he always went with me if dogs are permitted. And so this kind of shows this um, map here on the left shows the trail and it goes all the way through. They've expanded it over the years. And it's also connected to like the Appleton Preserve um, and it's connected to the Ridge to River Trail, which is another one I've done. Um, so there's all these little sections of this path that you can kind of break up and do. I don't know many people who just like walk it all the way through. <laughs> um, though I think that was the idea. And I think that, you know, they're trying to bring um, economy to these different um, towns. So if you do want to walk long sections of it, go right ahead and stay at an Airbnb or a, um, a bread and breakfast in the area. 
All right, John B. Mountain in Brooksville, another um, kind of lesser known place that I haven't seen other people at when I'm there. Um, and it's a kind of a representation of a land trust that I really love, the Blue Hill Heritage Trust. They have so many different properties. Um, and so if you check out their website, they like very detailed descriptions of each of their properties. And John B. Mountain is just one of them. And this is just a really easy hike. It's a great hike to bring kids on that are like young kids to introduce them to mountain hiking because the top has this bald, it's weird. It's like this bald mountain on the top, but it's not a very big mountain. It's just 250 feet. And the trail can get steep and rocky in some areas. So it will give people an idea um, of what it is like to hike a mountain, but in a very short period of time, um, it's just a one mile hike. And um, when I, I've hiked it in the winter and I've hiked it in the summer, um, both is beautiful. There are wild blueberries all over the place up there in the summertime. Um, in the winter, the evergreen forest near the top is absolutely beautiful. Um, it can be, you know, I remember doing it when it was very snowy and dogs are permitted on most, I think, I don't know if, yeah, I guess there's a couple of Blue Hill Heritage Trust trails where dogs are not permitted, but most of them they are. And this is just some photos of in the winter time when I was up there with Oreo. And um, I, this is a photo here of Peter's Brook Trail. And it's just another Blue Hill Heritage Trust trail that I love and it has a little waterfall that is absolutely beautiful. And now it's connected to the Penny's Nature Preserve which is super dog friendly. You can have your dog off leash and it was named after a dog. And the trail network was um, created by a guy who just absolutely loved his, I think it was a golden retriever and he donated the land after they built the trails. So that's Penny's Nature Preserve, which is connected to Peter's Brook Trail. And I wanted to talk about the Adonal Pond Public Reserve Land Unit. It's right in my area, my neck of the woods. Um, and I absolutely love it. And I think more and more people are hearing about it, um, but it's still, it's like in the Acadia region and it's not as busy by far um, as Acadia. Um, one of the parking lots can get very full in the summertime, but um, still it's um, one of those places that you don't see as much exploration. Um, so, Black Mountain rises about over a little over a thousand feet above sea level. And um, it, but it's one of several mountains that you can hike in Donald Pond Public Reserve lands. The hike is about three miles long. You can go up um, two different directions. You can go up the Big Chief Trail from one side, which is very mossy and rocky and cool. Um, or you can go up the uh, Black Cliffs Loop Trail and actually create like form a little loop. Um, and that's a good hike as well, but that's from the busier side by Scudic Mountain and Scudic Beach. Um, and you can see all this on a map online. If you go to the Donnell Pub, um, Pond Public Reserve Land Unit, it's a state owned property and there's a really detailed map online where you can see all of these hiking trails. But in addition to Black Mountain, which I think is um, lesser known than Scudic Mountain, which is right beside it um, for some weird reason, they both have beautiful views from the top. Um, there's Caribou Mountain, which is beside that, and there's Catherine Mountain, um, which uh, was reportedly named after the, the ghost named Catherine that is haunts the road there, the Blackwoods Road. Um, <laughs> so spooky. Um, then there's Tunk Tucker and Little Tucker that is that's not quite it's in kind of a different area, but nearby um, and all of those are great little hikes. Um, Dogs are permitted. Um, it's pretty lenient on state-owned land that's a public land unit, so you can have them off leash here and there. You, I think the beach you need to have them on leash. So there's a there's a popular beach nearby as well. And I've done a lot of pat paddling in that region. Um, there's um, for some reason, geological reason, uh, I don't know. The the lakes are really really crystal clear and they have tons of sand. So there's a lot of sandy beaches in that area. And here's are some of the photos that I've taken um, or my husband's taken of me um, it, doing some of these hikes. So we have Black Mountain and some of the views um, up in the top left. That's the Scudic Beach, which is a bizarre sandy beach. Um, and which is right, you, when you do the Black Mountain hike, you can come down and go to the beach. It's a part of the loop. And um, 
Let's see. Next, I wanted to talk about some of the Far East trails that I love because I always hear people talk about Cutler Cove, um, uh, Cutler, uh, the Bold Coast and on that whole area. And it's, so Cutler Cove um, or, or the preserve um, is kind of getting a little bit overrun. And so I've been visiting a couple other preserves in the area. Um, and one of my favorites is Bog Brook Cove Preserve, which is in, uh, it's in two different sections. It's in Trescott and, and Cutler and, or Trescott. One of you guys can correct me. Um, and it's a, a giant preserve. It's uh, almost, you know, it's getting up towards 2000 acres and it has five miles of trails and cobblestone beaches and freshwater pond. And um, one of the cool things about that preserve is it has this beautiful wheelchair accessible trail that leads to the coast and an overlook at the coast. Um, dogs are permitted. And I remember when I went with my dog Oreo, um, it was kind of, I think it was during the week and um, we drove to drive to the um, Trescott part of it you go through this beautiful blueberry barren. And I remember just being like, wow, we're really out here. Like we're all by ourselves out here. And we were the only people at the preserve um, and spent the whole day there. And it was about this time of year because I know there were blossoms and stuff all over the trees and um, it was just gorgeous. So that's a picture of when we went out and visited. Um, and so that's um, the, if you look at the map, you're looking at, the northern part of the map there, um, the near the chimney trail and the ridge trail. We went, this photo is taken up on the ridge trails. There's a little ridge on the property where you get a nice view. And then this is the beach down below. Sorry, I didn't let you guys see that for very long. <laughs> so some beautiful bold um, cliffs and cobblestone beaches in that area. And that's, that's, pretty much the case for a lot of eastern Maine. If you get way out there, you're going to see a lot of cobblestone beaches, um, which if you've never seen, it's kind of remarkable. All of the rocks are just completely smooth. Like some beaches, the rocks are big, like dinosaur eggs and, and just perfectly rounded. And then some, they're, they're much smaller. Um, and again, it's a geological stuff at works there that I don't know about, but it's really neat. Um, and you know, sometimes a little difficult for dogs to walk on though. So keep that in mind. Um, and I did want to talk about this funny uh, little mountain called Little Kineo Mountain near Moosehead Lake. So if you enjoy the, the Greenville area, um, there are plenty of lesser known trails out there. Um, just stuff that doesn't get as much fanfare for, for whatever reason. And so Little Kineo Mountain is actually taller than Kineo Mountain, which is the popular mountain in that area. So Kineo Mountain, um, absolutely beautiful, but you have to go out on a boat to get to it because it's out on this peninsula that's not accessible by a road really. So you need to take, um, there's a ferry that goes out to it, or if you had your own boat, you could go out to it. Or in the winter, you can walk out to it if the ice is thick enough, which we just did this past winter. So that's Kineo. Um, and it's very popular. It's, it's part of a state park and it has a uh, observation tower at the top where you get a 360 view of Moosehead, um, a great spot. But right nearby, right looking at it right from the shore is Little Kineo Mountain. And that is a great little hike. It's uh, steep. It's about two miles round trip. Um, and it's accessible from a road. So you don't need to do the whole boat thing. Um, you do have to navigate some logging roads with the Delorme Atlas, I suggest. Um, but it's a, it's a great little hike and is open views at the top. And I would say, um, you know, in addition, some other lesser known hikes in the area, um, I consider lesser known is number four mountain recently got a new trail and Eagle Rock recently got a new trail. And they're part of the, what's known as the Moosehead Pinnacle Pursuit, which is a hiking challenge. You can check it out online. Um, and so they're becoming more popular and there are better sign or signage to get to the trailheads. I remember when I initially did Eagle Rock, the trail included like a rope to get over <laughs> up this steep area. And the trailhead consisted of a sign that was made on the back of some road sign. And it was like, the lettering was like written on the sign and it was 
tacked to a tree and it was really hard to find. Um, so now it's all much better. There's official signage and parking areas and all that stuff um, for those trails. And then Little and Big Spencer have always held a special place in my heart. There are beautiful mountains in that region. And again, they just take some driving on logging roads. So um, I think that's why fewer people may go to those um, mountains. So these are some views, and this isn't the best of best days when I hiked it, it was very foggy, but still you can get an idea for the types of views that you'll see from Little Kineo. Um, and I'm sure you'd be able to see much further and more mountains on a clear day. And then this um, is Kineo, if you guys have never seen it, um, <laughs> summertime view and then a wintertime view. And these are um, Big and Little Spencer, and you can probably guess which is which, um, but Big is, is the big one. <laughs> and there's an interesting Big Spencer, um, I did that um, years and years ago when I was writing my thesis, that was one of the mountains that I did. Um, and it used to have an old warden's cabin at the top or near the, it was like halfway up actually. It wasn't, you know, you'd have to keep climbing. Um, which as warden cabins usually are. Um, and I remember I went up years later and the warden's cabin had been taken down as sometimes they are because they get a little bit um, unsafe. And so people are in and out of them and um, the state worries that they're gonna crash down on hikers. So that had been taken down. And then I got to the top and I don't know if you guys remember, but a, um, a communications work crew was up at the top years ago and um, a fire caught in the black spruce at the top um, from one of their, I don't know, maybe campfires or something. And so I remember I got to the top and a, there was just like, it was horrible. It was just like black. Um, and you could see the remnants of their camp. They just left behind and all this stuff. And a, it was horrible, but I've hear, I hear that it has been, it has recovered since, but, um, a good lesson, I guess, to be very safe with fires, especially the top of those mountains, those black spruce trees are super old and, uh, I think once you get into the root system, it can be a big problem um, once the fire gets into the roots. Um, and to, I think this is the final hike. I, I wanted to make sure I wrapped it up um, pretty quick, but um, I wanted to mention Horse Mountain in Baxter State Park. Um, and this is kind of my representative ambassador mountain for the north end of the park. Um, everybody where a lot of people go in the south end um, because they're headed to Katahdin and that's how you get to Katahdin and a lot of the mountains around Katahdin. Um, but I talked with some rangers years back and one of them said, you know, my favorite part is the north end of the park and nobody ever goes up there. <laughs> um, and so you go through a completely different gate. Um, it's Matagammon Gate and um, there's a beautiful campground up there, a couple um, places that you can stay. And that's how you get to Traveler Mountain, which is one of the more popular loops. So Traveler Loops is up there in the North End. Um, and that I would say is as challenging as Katahdin. Um, it might be a controversial thing to say, but if you do the whole Traveler Loop, um, it would probably be as difficult as climbing Katahdin. Um, and um, but there's some other small, really great mountains up there. So Horse Mountain is one of them. And I actually, when we were at the campground, I went and um, did Horse Mountain in the afternoon with my mom. So it's a fun little hike um, that doesn't have to take you all day, which I like those types, um, about three miles out and back. And it's, it's gradual and like a continual climb the whole way up. Um, and there's actually, the view is not at the summit. It's right before the summit. And there's this beautiful um, bald outcropping. And then nearby, you've got Trout Brook Mountain as well, which is another great little hike and also has some nice views. Um, but Horse Mountain, so this is the view from the East Spur Overlook. And then um, when I, I was pretty proud because I was bringing my mom out in the afternoon and we saw a, um, that barred owl right there sitting in the tree, just staring at us. Um, so I felt like a good guide to be able to show her this beautiful animal, but you can never count on that, of course. Um, and um, these are some view, this is a, some, a view from Trout Brook Mountain. So um, pretty nice little view for a smaller mountain in the North End. And then this is the Traveler um, Range. And that's just a really special hike. Um, I would suggest doing it in the fall because it's absolutely gorgeous in the fall. But um, it's, it's arduous, I will say that, it's, it's a challenge. 
And I did want to just offer um, if any of you guys want to contact me, um, because I'm no longer working full time for the Bangor Daily News, my email has changed. So it's just kind of like my personal email. So it's uh, two A's because my middle name is Anne and then Sarnacki at gmail.com. And, um, and then I'm one minute hike girl because my column was one minute hikes for so long. It was, I, I don't know if it's still referred to that in print. It might be um, sometimes off and on, but um, so it's one minute hike girl or Instagram. I've recently changed my handle to main nature hikes because that is hopefully what my new guiding company is going to be called. So we're getting underway kind of at least with the photos part of it and we'll see how the rest falls in place. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll open it up for questions and I'll stop sharing my screen so you guys can see me. Here we go. I guess that I'm going to um, ask some questions as you post them. And I hope we'll get a lot of them because I know we have a lot of hikers on this call. So um, please feel free to do that. Let's see. Oh, I asked the first question, <laughs> <laughs> funnily enough. So um, I uh, was asking, cause I've run into some uh, difficulties as I've hiked, especially by myself. Can you share with us some of the uh-oh moments you've encountered and how you got beyond them? Oh, I love, I love that. I, and I talk about it a little bit in my book, some of these uh-oh moments, because everybody learns from it, making mistakes. Um, <laughs> but one, one that I like to tell is I was on Old Spec Mountain early in my hiking days, um, actually for my thesis, writing my thesis, because I went on um, 10 different big mountain hikes throughout Maine to do my thesis back in college. And um, I was out there by myself because I did a lot of them solo, just kind of, um, uh, so I, I, and I was almost done. I was up because Old Speckett Mountain is a pretty big mountain um, in Western Maine. It's right on the Appalachian Trail. And you get to the top, there's a beautiful tower. You go past that and you get to Old Speck Pond, which is one of, I think it's the highest elevation pond in Maine. Um, and then I was headed back down and I was at one of the last overlooks and I'm standing there looking out over the terrain and I'm holding onto a tree and um, I get done looking and I step forward, trip on the tree root and fall flat on my face on this like just rock shelf. And I remember my sunglasses flew off my head and skittered down the rock shelf and almost fell off like the cliff. Um, and I remember just laying there being like, face down and being like, am I okay? Like, can I feel my hands and all that? And I was perfectly fine. I got up, but I was scraped on my whole, my hands and my knees and all down my legs was really bad, um, just abrasions. And so I was bleeding all over the place. I looked crazy. Um, and I remember I didn't have, I didn't have first aid. I didn't have any, anything with me to, you know, just patch myself up and um, ended up I was like close to the, you know, I was lucky and I was close to the trailhead. So I've just walked down all defeated. And I remember stopping at a stream and trying to wash myself off a little and trying to put some like leaves on my hands to stop the bleeding. And um, then I, I walk by this, this group's coming up and they're a bunch of little boys. And it was a, it was a boy scout group with their leaders. <laughs> and they looked at me like, I was something out of a horror movie, you know, and they were just like, I was so embarrassed because uh, I was perfectly fine, but I looked terrible. Um, and one of the boys is like, do you need first aid? <laughs> and I still remember being like, no, I'm OK. I'm like, I'll get to the, I'll get to the trailhead soon. Like, and I just felt so like this little boy's more prepared than me. And I actually should have let him give me first aid because he probably would have gotten a patch for that. But um, in hindsight, <laughs> but after that, I went and bought myself a first aid kit and I always carry it with me now. And so it's like, you don't know what's going to happen. And that wasn't a very big deal, but it taught me a valuable lesson to have things like a first aid kit and to have just a few survival items. Cause say I like had broken my ankle or something, I would just need like a, a, a space blanket or I prefer like a, uh, an emer emergency bivy to keep myself warm for the night. And I would have been fine. Someone would have come and found me, you know? Um, 
so just having like a few survival items i've i've heard that every good woodsman should go out into the woods with a, a means to make fire so just like waterproof matches or a lighter um you know a, a knife and um you know a way to have water so it's just thinking of those like essential things that you need and and you can really slim down your your kit your first aid and survival kit look it over don't just buy like a pre-made kit either like look into it and see if it has what you need um because you never know when you're going to need it and when a, a boy scout troop will come along or not <laughs> Um, next question. Um, where can we get copies of your books? I know I got mine at um, Left Bank Books in Belfast, and I'm always proud to uh, promote that bookstore. Great. Yeah, local bookstores are great at carrying it. Um, in my area, like the Briar Patch in Bangor, um, they carry it and Epic Sports in Bangor carries it. And I wish I had like a, I, I've asked my publisher, like, do you have a list of the stores that carry it? And they just don't offer that and they don't keep track of that, unfortunately. Um, but I would try your local bookstore for sure. Um, I've always been pleasantly surprised when I go into local bookstores and find it. Um, it is available online. Yep. But <laughs> local bookstores. Yes. Um, love this question. Have you seen any cool wildlife besides the owl? Yeah, I get lucky sometimes. I've never seen a bear while I'm out there. So people always ask me about bears. I think because they're scared, but I they run the other way, I think. Um, let's see, I've, I've come across a number of deer um, pretty close. I, I was in a field once with like a tall vegetation and almost like we almost stood, like stepped on each other. It was so, we were so close. Um, and I've done a lot of wildlife photography, um, so I'll go out and actually seek wildlife pretty often. So I've seen like a lot of eagles. I've seen snowy owls, um, specifically looking for them. Um, Trying to think of one of the coolest wildlife experiences I've had. I've seen porcupines fighting, but that was right at my house, so that wasn't on a hike. <laughs> that was <Yeah>. weird. <laughs> that was really weird. Um, yeah, I see a lot of different birds. Um, I've seen a mink mm. while I was um, along the shore. I didn't really know what it was. It was weaving in and out of seaweed. And I guess they, they eat stuff along the coast. Um, so I've seen a mink. Um, I've seen puffins. I guess that's one of the coolest things that I've seen is um, I got to go and visit a puffin island twice and got to go see the puffins with um, biologists and get to go into the burrows and see the baby puffins while they measured them and made sure they were all healthy and stuff. Um, that was one of the cooler things. And I have seen a bear, but only because I went out with biologists to see the bears in the winter time as they were hibernating. <laughs> and again, it was a part of a study. Next question. Can you recommend other hikes with paddling options? Mm. One cool one that if you like to go out and do like a real exploration out in the boonies um, is Lobster Mountain and Lobster Lake. And you start on Lobster Stream and it's in Lobster Township. So you won't forget any of that. <laughs> Someone was not, or maybe they were really creative. Um, and, and the lake, they say, is they're shaped like a lobster's claw and that's why, or um, it's because of the is it crayfish or something that look kind of like lobstery that are in the lake. They're not sure why that was named that because it's out in the, not even close to the coast. It's um, north of Moosehead Lake, uh, way, way up there, um, north of Moosehead Lake. So you have to go all the way around Moosehead. Um, and then you park. And so my husband and I did this and we brought a canoe and we brought our dog and um, you paddle down Lobster Stream into Lobster Lake um, and around the edge of the lake really is how I found it. Um, and there's a trailhead sign and then you can hike up Lobster Mountain to a beautiful view. Um, and you can camp out there if you want. There's beautiful campgrounds on Lobster Lake. Yeah, yeah sandy, sandy beaches too. Good. Uh, another water related question, any river trips? Mm, we haven't done a lot of river trips. Um, I've done some paddling on the Penobscot River with people who are a little bit more um, experienced, um, just because I think it's so cool now that the dams are down, how much the river has kind of renewed itself. 
And it is a great opportunity to see eagles. If you ever want to paddle on the Penobscot, it's like, man, every 10 minutes you're seeing an eagle because that, that's just rich in that area. Um, yeah, but we haven't done a lot of river trips. I mostly do lakes and ponds and uh, we just got sea kayaks last year. So we'll see where that leads us. It opens up possibilities when you have two uh, sealed bulkheads, you feel a little bit safer. So, and we've been taking um, courses on how to, we took a course from casting kayaks. They do a lot of um, skills courses if you're interested. And uh, we did a course on how to get back in your kayak if you fall out, which now we feel empowered, so. <laughs> Great. It's a question about beavers. Um, um, someone says, we saw evidence of them around Jordan Pond on Acadia, but didn't see the animals themselves. Yeah, I've seen beavers a lot, um, but it's hard because in the middle of the day when a lot of people are hiking, they're not necessarily as active. Um, you kind of have to get lucky. It's fun also to see them in the winter because sometimes they'll come out of their little huts in the winter time um, if they have a place to swim. But um, we've seen a lot of evidence of beavers. It's amazing what they can do and how big of trees they can fell. Um, and I remember once I was up in Aroostook um, National Wildlife Refuge, they have a lot of opportunity. That and Moosehorn National Wildlife Refuge, I don't know what it is about National Wildlife Refuges, but I've seen beavers there in the middle of the day just paddling around and flipping their tails at you, which tells you that they're not happy with you. So then you back off. <laughs> I've had two dogs chase beaver beavers. Yeah. I think the beavers would win. I think so too. They're te they've got some teeth. <laughs> um, several comments praising Lobster Lake um, for those of you who are reading the chats. And um, I think it's a place that would be nice for a Sierra Club hike. I have, um, I have a question about um, hiking and, uh, and walking for people who may have disabilities or mm -hmm. just feeling hesitant about getting out, might feel like they might be vulnerable because they're older, et yeah. cetera. Yeah, I think it's a great question. There are some, op there are some options in Maine. I, I looked into this, this is one of the um, stories that I did right before I left the BDN because it was something that was on my mind for years and it was a challenging thing to write. Um, so I have put at least one resource out there now that lists some wheelchair accessible trails um, or ADA compliant trails, I guess is what I'd call it, because really these ADA compliant trails are very strict guidelines about barriers to people and the surface and the grade. I did a lot of research into what makes a trail ADA compliant and it has to be certain width and it can't be too steep. Um, and um, so it takes a lot for a trail organization to a lot of funding really to create a trail like that in Maine in a place where we have so many roots and rocks. And so it's remarkable that we do have quite a few of these trails, but um, I think I talked to a fellow from the state. Um, um, he's in charge of outdoor recreation in the state. And he says there's always something on their mind and that it's a work in progress that I think you're gonna see more and more of these trails pop up. And I have over the years seen more and more accessible trails pop up, which is just awesome. Um, and you know, it's good for people in wheelchairs, but it's good for people who use any type of mobility device or wanna use their stroller with their newborn baby. Um, you know, so it's um, one of, you know, there's there's a quite a few um, now, and I would look at also the um, rail trails because Maine has that wonderful rail trail that goes through the whole a big section of the state um, and, and that's a great opportunity as well. Um, but in addition, there's a lot of trails that don't meet ADA standards, but are easy. Um, and so they might have a few barriers here and there, or they might be a little bit narrower than a trail that um, is ADA compliant. So there's a lot of easy trails out there. And I've noticed that a lot of local land trusts are in charge of a lot of those easier trails. So if you're interested in just not these crazy hikes, but maybe some easier, shorter hikes, um, I would definitely check out your local land trust. And the way I do it um, is I go to the main land trust network. It's ML, well, main land trust network. Yeah, 
it's that abbreviated. <laughs> and uh, that website, uh, so it's ML, mltn.org. Um, and that website, you can, it breaks it down into um, different counties. So you can check out what land trusts are active in your county. And uh, so I highly suggest that. And also my book, Family Friendly Hikes in Maine has a lot of trails that are easy um, and trails that are part of trail networks. So you don't like, you can go out and do like a third of the trail network and not feel like you turned around too soon or whatever, because um, trail networks kind of leave it up to you how much you want to do and yeah. All right. I know we have hikers on this call and you're probably dying to ask questions. I think we can take about five more minutes or so. So um, post them up there. Let's see what you have to say. Anybody got anything? Yeah, I've got questions. tons of questions. <laughs> There's one more in the chat from Claudia. Um, how do you dress or pack for winter hikes? That's a great uh, question. I started my column in November and I never hiked in the winter before. This was years ago. Um, and so I had to learn that fast. <laughs> and I've kind of learned over the years, some tips, um, things that worked and didn't work. Um, so basically just dress in layers because you get surprisingly warm on a lot of winter hikes. Like I've stripped down to snowshoeing in my t-shirt and snow pants, which looks ridiculous. In, in March when the sun is so warm and we're getting those longer days back. Um, so I would dress in a lot of layers um, and avoid cotton when at all possible because cotton holds on to moisture and then cools your body down. So if you like sweat or because you're gonna sweat when you hike, try not to as much as you can when you winter hike and do that by taking off layers, um, but you're still gonna sweat. And so wearing synthetics or there's some really, really soft wool now, but it's expensive, like Merino wool. Um, but I have a base layer that's Merino wool and it's super thin and it's amazing how warm it keeps me. Um, and it's like odor resistant. So <laughs> you can wear it a few times. My name is you Robert want. Pantel, P A N T E L. I'm not sure how connected with you. What was that? Oh, I don't think. I don't know. Um, yeah. Okay, I will put in a plug for my favorite box store in Maine, Rennie's. Yes. Um, you can get Merino wool uh, blends at, at Rennie's during hunting season. And it's really, they're really cheap. The shirts are really cheap. The long underwear is really cheap and it's wonderful. Oh. Yeah. Um, I, Becky has a question. What? All right. Oh, <laughs> Becky has a question about Isla Ho. Sure. I think I'm, oh, I thought I was muted. I just, have you hiked on Isla Ho? Before? I have, I have. I went out with two women in early spring um, and we stayed at one of the campsites out in Isla Ho. So we took um, the, the, is it the mail, mail carrier ferry type thing across. Um, we actually took our bikes because to get to the camp grounds from that drop-off point is pretty far um, on a road. You can also hike it. Someone came across with backpacks and they, the, a couple, and they hiked through and there was, there's a trail that you can hike through. Um, but we wanted to get the campsite kind of early. So we brought our bikes and pedaled in. Um, and the, the campsites are absolutely beautiful and um, quiet and just like surrounded by this beautiful forest. And it's kind of, it's close to the shore. You can go down and check out the shore. Um, and we hiked around, there's these nice little hills and uh, like rocky, rocky hills on Idaho. So there's plenty of opportunities for hiking, but we just stayed the one day. So we stayed the one night and then we hiked the next morning and then biked back out. Um, but I'm sure people stay longer. I do know it can be tough to reserve camping there that you have to do it really, you have to be on it and do it ahead of time. We actually, the only reason I think we got a spot um, like we did is because we went in early May and um, which is actually kind of cool because there were no bugs and we could just stay in the lean to without a tent and uh, look at the stars and uh, wear winter hats. <laughs> so it was, it was an interesting experience. I, I wanted to mention, uh, could I just say one thing? 
Sure. It's merino wool because it's a merino sheep. Uh -huh. so I just so you, you that that's where the wool comes from. So just uh -huh. I'm a sheep farmer, so I just wanted to give you that piece of information. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. I love uh, I love the fabric. I also really like um, I have alpaca socks, which are great too. <laughs> <laughs> just go with the natural fibers it really wow. does help um yeah and they're made in maine yeah yeah alpaca, alpaca socks maine. yeah i know I, lo I love them so much <laughs> well it's five minutes till the hour if um if anybody has any more questions or comments or let me just remind you all that this community conversations episode is going to be archived on our website um, Sierra Club Maine. So um, tell your friends if they wanted to come but couldn't. Um, it's a great place to get a lot of good information. And um, I'm just loving these books. And I hope that you will check them out. You could borrow mine, but not for a while because they're all going to be dog eared and messy. Um, <laughs> so yeah. I guess that's it for this conver this community conversations. And thank you so much, Aislinn. I'm personally going to contact you about hiking. So awesome. um, thank you so much. Please do. <laughs> yes, yes. And others are encouraged to as well. Thank you so much, Aislinn. I did want to share my screen just to remind people of the um, hike that the, our outings team is putting on on Memorial Day, which is May 31st. It's at 2 p.m. And I will actually put a link in the chat. If you're interested, you can register for the hike. So I hope to see some people there. And thank you, Aislinn. It was so awesome to hear about all your different hikes. I know me and my husband are definitely going to try some and to see all of those awesome photos. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for joining us.